Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage, Adam Pennington. Well, welcome back from break. Hopefully, if you're home or here, you got a chance to see Cat uh, on the couch or you know, got a snack, drink, you know, ready to get going again. So now into our regular program. So first talk coming from our call for papers. We're going to have uh, Jason Wood and Justin Swisher from CrowdStrike. So I'm a sucker for talks with real threat data. I'm, I'm always excited to hear about things that, that adversaries have really done in the wild. But this proposal it caught our eye specifically, talk, combining attack analysis of some of this real threat data with a platform we really don't see that much in reporting Linux. So please help me welcome to the stage, Jason and Justin. Thanks, Adam. You guys hear me okay? Audio check? Oh, awesome, awesome. Cool. Um, so yeah, Jason, I think you're the first bio yep. slide. So hi, everybody. My name is Jason Wood. Um, I'm an intrusion researcher on the Overwatch team at CrowdStrike. Uh, Overwatch is our threat hunting team. And so yeah, we look at a lot of intrusions every week, hands-on, somebody's gone interactive on systems. So this is just kind of a snapshot into that. Um, what we're gonna be talking about here, I know it's just Justin and I up here talking, but there is a whole team on our outreach team that you know, does this analysis and, and, and really helped build what we're, we're talking about here today. Um, so yeah, with that, um, Justin? Yeah, so Justin Swisher, um, I have a little over a decade of experience. I started as a civilian intel analyst at the Air Force looking at foreign command and control networks and then foreign malware against air and space systems. Uh, bounced around to a bunch of different vendors doing network security monitoring, threat intel consulting. And then the last few years I've spent most of my time on endpoint threat hunting, which I really enjoy and obviously we're gonna be talking a lot about today. So I wanna dive right in with why do we track intrusions? I don't know if you've read the book, Start With Why by Simon Sinek love that book and I always approach everything with the why. Why am I doing this? What's the purpose behind it? And so when we look at intrusion tracking, we understand why do we go about doing this? Like we gotta put all this effort into it, tagging everything with MITRE. And the first thing is we wanna understand successes, ours and our adversaries. What are the te techniques that they're using that they're successful with? How are they operating and getting past our defenses? What are they doing that's successful and they're repeating over and over again? And then when we think about our successes, what are we doing in terms of triggers and hunting leads that is catching this adversary? You know, what are the techniques that they're leveraging that we're like, yes, we've got that, we're eyes on that, you know, where are our successes? So we wanna to continue to focus on those areas, but then we wanna look at the failures as well. What did the adversary do that didn't work? Did they type a command wrong? Did they bring in a tool for the wrong architecture? We see that oftentimes, like what are they doing that's failing? And also when they conduct, you know, something like Mimi Cats, is it being prevented? Is that's a failure on there and it did not work? You know, but our failures as well. When we, you know, we research these intrusions, we're, okay, maybe we catch it here. This is a hunting lead that fired. What else happened where we could have triggered a little earlier? You know, maybe prevention was not enabled. That's a failure on our end. You know, the, the technology could have stopped this, but it didn't. And then that leads into gap analysis. You know, what are our coverage gaps? Where could visibility be improved? As we look at the, the matrix, the techniques that we're identifying, you know, where are those slightly less red spots if you're thinking about the attack navigator? You know, why aren't we catching things there? Could we improve visibility, better detection, better collection, and then improve our hunting patterns? So we take all of that to identify and document and keep track of that. And then, you know, this is hands-on keyboard activity. Our adversaries are developing and growing. Over time, and Jason will talk to this a little bit later, we want to understand what techniques continue to show up, you know, quarter after quarter, year over year, that are successful, and then where are they improving? Where are they growing? Where are they developing? And can we identify those clusters of activity? So, you know, we really dig into um, hands-on keyboard intrusions only. That's what we focus on at Overwatch and in the outreach team. And so we are mapping individual unique events within an intrusion to the attack matrix. Um, you know, and it's really fun to be able to kind of dig down in and look at, you know, a single line is an actual process rollup or in a network connect. You know, and we're actually looking at hundreds to what thousands of lines, you know, and depending on the intrusion, the scope of the intrusion. And we're gonna map everything that we can to MITRE ATT&CK. So we have some examples here, you know, initial access, valid accounts. 
how many people continue to see valid accounts leveraged against them every single day? I, I see heads nodding, right? It, you know, externally accessible RDP, just constantly happening. So that's going to be our initial access valid account, you know, and then we'll see things like registry modifications. So event triggered execution accessibility features. What's nice about this line is that it actually applies to two different techniques. And sometimes we have to be very careful when we're mapping, you know, are we hitting both techniques? It's, we catch each other's mistakes all the time. We spend a lot of time. Uh, it's not unusual when, we, when we're bringing in new people to the outreach team because we're doing this analysis. Inevitably, you have these questions. Well, I've got this command line doing this. How does this map? Where does this map to the framework? And so we're going through that. And I'm telling people all the time, oh, don't worry. I'll be asking the same questions. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because uh, adversaries are doing different things. And you're just like, where does this fit? Yeah. Yeah, we have great discussions along. Where does this fit exactly? Well, it could be here. Maybe it's over here. It spurred some discussion around, should we submit something to MITRE for maybe a new technique? Um, but just some examples there to kind of go through. And you know, that's our job every single day. We really enjoy it. But last year, 2021, we observed 960 hands-on keyboard intrusions. Roughly. Almost 1,000 hands-on keyboard intrusions across our customer set. That's a lot. Even for the, the size team that we have, that is a lot. And so we have to store, memorialize, and use this data. And that's not easy. Um, not just the, the individual command lines, not just the MITRE attack, but the metadata around it. What is the vertical? You know, is it e-crime? Is it you know, targeted nation state? What is our attribution confidence of e-crime or targeted nation state? And so we've looked at a few different tools. Obviously, you have wonderful spreadsheets. We all love spreadsheets. Um, the MITRE attack navigator is great for visualizing it. We've settled on MISP for the last couple of years. So the malware information sharing, sharing platform. <laughs> I knew I'd get it. Um, you know, that's where we, we memorialize a lot of our data. And it's not perfect, but it's worked well. We're actually right now in the process of building our own tool um, with our research and development team because we need some more specific use cases. But this is really important because what it allows us to do is look at trends over time, right? What verticals are targeted? what adversaries are targeting those verticals. What are the techniques that you're using in those verticals by those adversaries and where they're successful? You know, it allows us to ask a lot of questions of the data to present a picture to the other hunters, to our customers, what we're seeing, you know, how we're stopping it, how we're growing and developing our own team. And so just a quick example of kind of how we do this. So we dig, um, we, each intrusion event is tracked as one MISP event. And we will tag that with the metadata. So we have, you know, our, uh, what we call our intent tag, right? E-crime or targeted when it's known. The analyst, uh, the customer vertical uh, operating system that was used, our attribution confidence. We track the metric of breakout time, right? So if we know the initial access and we don't use things like valid accounts because they could have gotten those from other means. But when we see that initial access from the time that they get on a box to the time they move, we track that as breakout time. So that's tagged in there as well. Um, We've modified the galaxies a little bit. So we've added uh, specific galaxies for our use case here. So we've got region, um, subregion if we see it, malware and tools. So it'll allow us to tag, you know, Cobalt Strike, Mimi Cats, the ones that we all love and see all the time. Um, the adversary as well. So if we have a named adversary associated to that activity, we have that as a galaxy. And then the attack pattern. So MISP is really great. It allows us to tag those things. There's some challenges around MISP with how they update keep, store, and track some of that information. We've worked around it as best we can, but what it does is it allows us to query all of that and build out pictures and trends. And so that's where I'm gonna let Jason kind of dive into more specifics around Alrighty. some of the stuff that we see. So um, this intrusion was one, I was hunting around, I'm like, what are some, we see a number of Linux intrusions, what would be interesting to even talk about? Because I'm sure you've all looked at intrusions where you're like, okay, this was more of the same. We really don't care that much about this. Um, so I, I found this one I thought was, was was interesting enough to bring up. Now, we don't have any idea who this threat actor is. There's no attribution. We, I, there was no telling whether this was e-crime or whatnot uh, from the information we had. Uh, maybe that changes over the future, but uh, at this point, they, they compromised a web application running on Linux. And so they get going uh, and start initiating their, their actions on objective. And so I'm watching this the, as I'm going through command line by command line to see what happened. You see this command start really 
very close. There's a little bit of reconnaissance, but then they start off with this find command. They're looking for dot properties files on the system. So, okay, well, that makes sense. I'm looking through and tagging things back to, mapping it back to MITRE ATT&CK. Well, then we've got file and directory discovery. We're, we're crawling through the file system, see what we have that's interesting. This sounds an awful lot like what I did when I was penetration testing and I popped a system. I wanted to see, all right, what do I have? I don't even know what's going on here. Um, so they find all the property files on the system, and this is just one example, looking at a Tomcat's uh, properties file. You know, they're looking at data from the local system. They actually spent about 30 minutes digging through different property files after property file after property, and just looking at this list. And um, finally, I think, and this is just me guessing, because I'm, I'm putting it you know, kind of my bias on this or whatever from, from doing this. They got really annoyed with whatever they had for access to the system. They're like, man, we have got to expand access to this. So let's pull down some tools. And in this case, they pulled down what, or tried to pull down uh, what is likely fast reverse proxy. And, um, you know, it looks like some kind of compromised WordPress site that where they had this stored up there. They go to pull it down. You see a pause on the timing, nothing happens. Oh yeah, don't check for the certificate, we got an error, it didn't work. <laughs> so they get it down, great. All right, we've got ingress tool transfer. So now we've got this down onto the system and I'm you know, dutifully mapping everything out here trying to figure out you know, you know, how am I gonna talk about this later in a report or anything, uh, that this comes up later. And so then, now let's execute this. So fine, we're gonna execute our proxy. It didn't work. What happened? Oh yeah, I gotta add execute <laughs> permissions to the file. Doggone it, <laughs> eat it when that happens. Um, and we've all seen probably this in intrusions. You see somebody hop on a Windows box, they run LS or they run cat. And you're like, yeah, dude, I feel your pain, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, but so then they, you know, this is basically modifying the file system permissions on the system um, so that they can then try and run their tooling. And then they turn around and try and execute it again. We're back to executing the, the you know, the proxy application. Um, now they got a little frustrated at this point because as it turned out, Falcon of course is running on this host. That's how we see the data in Overwatch as Falcon collects all this. Um, it prevented it. And so they tried this a few times and they went for a while. And then they finally went, all right, this isn't working. Now what? Let's go back with something simple. We'll just use bash, we'll use dev TCP, we'll connect out to this host on, uh, on uh, port 9999 and see what happens here. Uh, we've got you know, non-standard port being used. We've got you know, the capabilities of the command and scripting interpreter being used as well as you know, the Linux file system and, and capabilities of the OS. Um, again, they got prevented and they tried this for probably about 20 minutes and you're watching them work their way through this. Finally, they, I don't know where this file came from. And one of the, the interesting things about being a threat hunter is you don't always see all of the data. There's one thing that was told to me early on that made me feel a lot better with threat hunting. Um, an intrusion is never one event. If you miss one detection, you didn't miss an entire intrusion. A lot of stuff is happening. So, okay, I didn't, we I didn't have some visibility to when this file got here, but shell.elf, well, I'm gonna make some guesses about what this is doing. Um, I don't know for certain, it's running on somebody's system. It's not like I can pull it down and, or I don't have any access to the end environment, pull down files. Um, but it looks like we're trying to execute some kind of shell to, you know, some kind of custom compiled tool. Um, they're using this underneath, you know, again, the command scripting interpreter, you know, bash, uh, the Unix shell. And then um, this got prevented again. They tried a number of different times to get this to go. And then they finally just gave up and deleted the file and quasi cleaned up after themselves. The amusing thing is they just deleted the one file, the INI file for fast reverse proxy, the binary there, yeah, that stayed on the system. Um, the funny part is uh, that this intrusion, they stopped for the day. The next day they come back and they spent several hours again trying to get something to run on this. Now the interest, uh, the thing that I thought was funny about this, and I can recognize myself in this, you get so fixated on what you're trying to do that you don't stop and think, well, 
why am I trying to get, the, I mean, they already had access to the system. What are some other things they could have done on this? I, I don't know. They got tunnel vision though on, I got to get a reverse shell running. And then they finally gave up and went away. Uh, you know, we're notifying the customer throughout all of this and, 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 and getting them to respond. So hopefully they got them contained and cleared out. Uh, but, you know, this is our process here is we're going to see command line by command line what the adversary is doing. Now, we're endpoint centric, right? Uh, the, Selena already talked a little bit earlier about things that they see at proof point. We have the things that we see in our data set. Um, that, and uh, so our graphs or the things that we're seeing are, are going to vary a little bit. That's fine. Um, but you know, this is our process for going through and seeing, okay, what is this adversary doing? And then we come back later, you know, the hunters, they're trying to move at speed here. Um, and so they've got to notify the customer as fast as they can. Whereas for us, you know, we can spend a little bit more time doing the analysis. All of this is going, being captured, put into MISP uh, and memorializing that there so that we can go back and do reports on it later. Now this is, I don't expect anybody to read this. <laughs> Uh, really just pay attention to some of the shading here. This is Q1 2021, and just kind of what was popular, you're seeing valid accounts are being used in the command and scripting interpreter Unix shell. Uh, things moved around a little bit in Q1 of 2022 instead. So you know, it's kind of interesting to just sit here and just kind of see some of the movement. Why did, why did this happen? What was going on? What are some of the differences? We can dive into that a little bit further. And in this case, you know, we've got uh, Q1 2021 on the right, on the left, excuse me, and then on the right we have 2022. I focus just on a few items here. Um, we actually initially broke out all of the differences out and that was probably too much. But some interesting things to me here was, you know, at the top we have valid accounts as being one of the most predominant defense evasion, you know, areas of the heat map. We go to 2022, defense that, that's actually swapped. More cleanup is occurring. The adversaries are doing a little bit more cleanup. Um, why is that? Is that interesting? And that's where we start doing our analysis when we're doing our reports, you know, start to look at what's happening. What is there a trend that occurred here along the way? Um, what has gone on that, that makes this interesting to us? And what do we think that it tells us about the adversary? One of the things I like to say is that every time an adversary runs a command, they tell us something about themselves, about what they're trying to do, what their goals are, and stuff like that. Um, credential access. You see unsecured credentials being the primary area where we saw them looking for a password being stored somewhere, something like bash history or files on the system. Swapped a little bit in 2022. We see a little bit more access going after... Etsy shadow and Etsy, pa uh, Etsy password. Uh, systems are being compromised with, they're maybe running with privileges that they shouldn't or they're elevating uh, their privileges. So we can see a little bit of movement here and that allows us to just kind of see, you know, use uh, MITRE ATT&CK to see how things are changing over the time. If I'm trying to dig into individual command lines, this can be very overwhelming very quickly. Some trends. Um, that I noticed as I was just kind of looking at 2022, you know, the most recent data, what, what are we seeing adversaries do? And this is all Linux centric. Uh, what am I, what are we seeing here? Uh, what I've seen is, as I reviewed the data was, Hey, we have a little bit more exploitation of some kind of web application. We're reasonably certain as a public facing application for the initial access. Of course, the Unix shell is going to be involved for any of this stuff. Um, as they're executing commands underneath it. You see them trying to establish persistence with web shells. Now that is pretty consistent across Windows or Linux, um, but that is that is definitely one you'll see happen. Uh, defense evasion, they're going out and they're trying to clear their, their command histories, they'll delete files that they drop, usually rather haphazardly, occasionally you run into a very conscientious adversary that you watch go back and delete everything that they dropped on the system. Uh, but that's actually a little bit more rare. And I'd say one thing that I find interesting, at least when I look at the data, is that clearing command history, clearing logs happens more on, that I've noticed on Linux than it does on Windows. Yeah. You know, I don't know what it is about, just maybe they're more comfortable with the Linux logging or 
But I've noticed a lot of times that defense evasion, those clearing system logs, comes much more on Linux than it does on a Windows system. Yep. Yeah. And um, and yeah, you do see those variations between what an actor is comfortable with on one environment versus another environment. And you, see, I don't know. I find it to be kind of fascinating to see how this goes. Um, again, our credential access, I've already commented, it's access for Etsy Shadow and Etsy Password has bumped up a little bit, but you still see them looking through bash history. Um, you know, how many shell scripts have you seen in your time uh, working that required you to type the password into the command line as you went? You know, because we just cobbled this thing together. So <laughs> there we go. And we log all of this. Uh, lateral movement. If it's on Linux, typically you're going to see this happening via SSH. If they can steal credentials, they can do some password cracking. Sometimes you see them get a hold of private keys and try and use that to move laterally to other hosts via SSH. A lot of collection and every, you know, very consistently you're seeing tools being dropped into the hosts. Why are we doing this? What are the benefits to all of this work? I mean, we're putting it all into MISP. We have some different tools wrapped around this to try and extract data out of it to, to, to use. What's the point? Um, one thing is it allows us to go back and see if something interesting has happened, something interesting has changed over time. You're in the thick of it, you know, just kind of doing your day-to-day -day work and uh, wherever that may be. For us, it's intrusion analysis. For the threat hunters, it's detecting whatever is currently happening. And you don't necessarily know what's changed over time because you're just focused, you know, right here and right now, maybe last week or last month, but that's about the end of it. Um, so using that, go back to that heat map, that allows me to see something has changed here. Why did it change? Did something new pop out of this? So you can dig into that. Um, one thing that I really like with, um, with attack is it gives us a, a very consistent way to talk about what we're seeing to different audiences. Uh, the technology folks have pretty well gotten into this, though they'll always want to see the command lines and and whatnot as much as we can, but if I'm talking to a CSO, they don't care that much about that detail. They just want to know, you know, kind of the high level, tell me what's going on. And I say customers up here because that's what I was thinking of as my typical audience, but for you and your organization, who are your stakeholders? Who are your customers um, that you need to be communicating with? And, you know, that may be the, um, the CSO in your environment, or it may be a, an auditor that's come in, or whoever it is that you're briefing on something. And so, you know, this gives us that ability to, to, to normalize on what we're doing. And when I say um, doing something like ingress tool transfer, the other person who is familiar with MITRE ATT&CK has an idea of what that means. And I don't have to fumble around for words and they they're trying to interpret what I meant to say. Um, and you know, for us, it facilitates our, our public reporting as well. Um, a lot of companies are doing public reporting. Uh, for us and our team on Outreach, the, the, our annual threat hunting report is our big public report that we do. Uh, the, the, here's our tw uh, the name of our 2021 uh, threat hunting report. You can always Google that and and go take a look at that. But that was a look back at the, the previous year and see what have we been seeing? What's changed over time? What are some meanings that we can extract from that? Um, we've definitely found that it's not an exact science by any stretch because as we've already said, we'll hop on Slack and we're like, hey, what do you think about this? Uh, I don't know. Let me dig around and we'll hunt around. But through that consensus, it allows us basically to better communicate what adversaries are doing and then hopefully inform our customers what they need to do to respond to that. Where do they need to shore up their defenses? Hey, could we detect this in our environment or not? Um, so these are some of the benefits to, to use a minor attack. That's why we go through this work and why we, we find this to be useful and, and hopefully our customers do as well. I've gotten some good feedback from them on this. Um, and with that, I think uh, we've, that's what we have. We'll go to some questions. First off, oh yeah, <laughs> give it up, great job. Um, so while we give folks in the room a couple minutes to maybe think about some questions, I think we have a little bit of time here. 
Um, really good note and feedback I was getting from Slack was the appreciation for you know, the way you're reporting, not just tactics and techniques, but really getting down into the procedures. What advice would you give for you know, Intel producers or anyone doing IR or threat hunting and they're producing these products and how to really you know, make the most of including those procedures? Like, Is there any tips and tricks, lesson learned that you can share with the, the crowd? Um, so probably the biggest, the first spice that comes to mind, uh, Selena already commented on earlier today, was who is your audience? Who are you writing this to? If I'm in, a, in an IR report and I, I'm, you know, there's something I'm going to have to communicate to executives and there's something I'm going to have to communicate to the technology people so that they can learn from that. Um, so a lot of times when we're going through the, our reporting, we're trying to, to keep that in mind. When I finish writing something up uh, for our report, I really spend some time trying to think about my conclusion. What what's the point? I just talked about this cool intrusion. What does this matter? What can you take away from this in your environment? What do I want the reader to think of? Yeah, yeah and I would echo what Selena said about bias. Like my bias is I want to see the command line. I want to know exactly what they're doing, you know, because that's more interesting. But a lot of times, that may not be relevant to the person reading it. And so know when that procedure, like if that command line says something about the intent, says something about the capability, it may be valuable. Whereas if it's a command line you've seen 10, 15, 20 times, it may not have any utility in that report or someone may just say, okay, that's cool, but I can't, I can't write a detection for that or that doesn't tell me anything about the adversary, then you probably don't need to include it. So know when the detail is, yeah. is actionable and know when it's just fluff that you want to toss in there because it looks cool. Any questions from the room? Actually, we'll, we'll start oh, right up front. Yeah, give the examples that obviously there are lots of nests that have a lot of nests. There is absolutely a lot of nests, yeah. <laughs> So quick uh, recap for the uh, online audience. The observation was that a lot of the intrusions that you're analyzing don't necessarily flow from left to right or sequential. It's a lot of you know, looping or within the matrix or moving around a bit, little bit. And that's something we've done intentionally in, in terms of not prescribing a sequence of tactics. But what are your observations and what are your takes in terms of you know, how do you process and deal with that? Um, so we do that. It's kind of interesting as you look at the different analysts and how they do it. I am very time driven. I will sort out all the command lines and I'm just going to pick through these things in order and make my notes accordingly on it. One of the things we do to try and capture that and add some context to that is we try and write a summary of what happened around this, kind of a narrative, even for our notes, so that um, if Justin enriches something and I have to look at this later, I can look at his summary and get kind of a flow for how the intrusion went. And you can see them jump around for the, the techniques. Um, so that's, that's one way that we, we work to address that. Is it perfect? No, we're, we're working on trying to improve that because some yeah. of these intrusions get rather complex. And that's, and that's where that, like MISP has been really good for us for the past couple of years. The challenge has been it doesn't allow us to collate the time that that tactic was leveraged. And so the tool that we're working on building is going to bring in that time-based analysis where you can take a command line, tag the technique to it with a timestamp, and then start to move through and say, okay, yeah. So they did some discovery, tried to do some persistence, went back to discovery, and, and see that movement. Right now it's just here's the data. And then the, the write-up is really where that narrative comes out. I and love then hopefully we'll see that, oh, sorry. Uh, hopefully then, you know, we'll see that in the products that we're producing because that'll allow us to speak more to that. And I love what you said earlier about, you know, the attackers aren't perfect. You know, they're making mistakes, we're watching those, but neither is defenders. We don't have the expectation of needing to see every bit of data and, you know, every single technique versus, you know, working with what we have and making the most of it. So I think we're coming up on time, but I did have one really interesting question from Slack that I wanted to run by you was, you know, in the course of an investigation or any of your processes, if you see a technique that you can't map to attack, what would be your reaction or what would you do? <laughs> That's normally where the Slack discussion gets hot and heavy is, all right, where, where does this fit? What do we do? Um, we have a, a, a process on the team where if it doesn't fit, um, we bring it to the wider team. So obviously we, we're, we're across the globe, so we've got folks in Australia, UK, America. And so like normally when we're working, we're in the similar time zones. So we'll bring it to the whole team, and then that's where that discussion comes up. Should this be something that we surface up? So one of our analysts in Australia is working on 
something to submit, um, something we came across. Right, and I can't remember what the details are at off the top of our head, something but it was RDP. Some, yeah, it was around RDP uh, and some use of it, but it didn't fit in really well with how things were. So he's like, "Well, wouldn't it make sense to submit this?" And we're like, "Go forth, <laughs> do <laughs> it." Happen, yeah. Shameless plug. We'd love to make that slide Adam showed earlier uh, much bigger. So definitely keep those contributions coming. But with that, uh, thank you again, and I, we will reintroduce our MC to introduce our next speakers. Thank you. Thank you.